There we go. Now we're being recorded. Um, if you're not actually speaking, probably a good idea to keep your mic off. Um, bark barking dogs and flushing toilets can be distracting. And then uh, I forgot to check with this, uh, Maria. How do you guys want to handle questions and answers and comments? I'll use the chat for that, please. And there are going to be times when we invite uh, comments from from uh, from participants. And so at that point, definitely please use the chat. But anytime you have a question, please throw it in the chat. And um, if we know that we're going to be dealing with it later in the in the session, um, then we will just. Uh, go through or we'll uh, we'll answer it at a time which uh, which makes sense to us and if at the end you still uh, feel that we haven't properly answered it then we will open it up perfect um, so a couple of words about the RA center uh, been around for well, since the early 50s um, all kinds of different things that little blue building there is where we're headquartered um, Oh, come on. RA has all kinds of different things going on there. Um, the uh, hockey is no longer, but they do have the, for example, the largest soccer organization or uh, league in Ottawa, uh, the largest indoor gun range, uh, fitness centers, uh, chess, you, know, uh, you name it. Um, and then it's the, the mission is. Uh, they want people or they want the RA Center to be uh, people's first choice for activities and getting together with others. Uh, um, again, just a, a brief uh, snapshot of some of the activities that are available. Um, by the way, for some of those, uh, the participants in those clubs have gone to uh, international competitions and won medals. Uh, most recently, um, Pre-COVID, uh, the badminton people won medals at the uh, um, uh, North American Games. Okay. Canoe Club. Now, this to me is the best part of the RA Center. Uh, we've been around for 70 years now, uh, under the Y until 2012. The most important thing here is we're uh, organized and led by volunteers. So volunteers step up. We get a really good program. If they don't, nothing happens. So day trips, weekend trips, longer trips. Um, we have the equipment that you need, um, but a lot of people bring their own. Um, that's not necessarily a recommended canoeing technique. So on with the show. Uh, as I say, we're presented by Hartley, Maria, and Nancy. Uh, the good thing about them is not only do they have a lot of experience dehydrating and knowing how to make it uh, safe, uh, they also make it taste good. And the example I use is I have never in my life, with one exception, had a beef jerky that tasted anything other than shoe leather. And the one exception was some beef jerky that Hartley made with his dehydrator. So. Uh, on with the show. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't distract people. Um, and then Maria and Nancy, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to confirm that uh, you can see uh, the uh, the slideshow. So you should see a, a title excellent that says "Food Dehydration Basics for Wilderness Camping." Um, so we can see that. Excellent. And um, there is a lot of stuff that we're, I mean, by all means, take notes if that is something that helps you learn. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, the reference type information from this uh, um, from this is also on a website that we made so that you don't have to frantically write down if you want to fully attend um, and listen to what we're saying and ask questions. So there is a, a website on this page that I'm displaying is uh, sites.google.com. And I have also posted that uh, into the chat um, so that you can copy and paste it onto your onto your computer. So uh, that is that's there and we'll I'll, I'll make sure that I'll remind you at the end to make sure that you pull that off because that's how you'll have this information available to you after the session. 
So I'd like to start by asking a couple of questions. Number one, do you already use a dehydrator for trip preparation? A yes or no? Um, so I get a, I get a thumbs up from, from David. If you would rather not share your screen, I understand. Maybe just a yes or no in the chat window. Um, part of this is just so that we understand. Um, I don't want to... Um, we don't want to to be too advanced in what we explain, but we also don't want to talk down to people. So just getting a sense of where you're at, so it uh, would would help us to um, to make sure um, uh, that we that we take that um, address this as needed. Um, so I see a couple of no's, a few no's. Just bought a dehydrator. Okay, so um, then I will uh, we will make sure that we talk about the basics. Some of you, this will be stuff you already know. Um, and um, if we're seeing something that is, is contrary to your experience, then throw that in the chat because, you know, Hartley, Nancy, and I do have experience using dehydrators, um, but we're not experts by any means. Um, part of, you'll see in the presentation, part of what we've done is, is, is consult experts um, when it comes to food safety. And, and also when it comes to recipes, we've, we've got some recipes from some really great books. Uh, but, you know, there's always stuff that, that um, all of us can learn. And, and if you can add to this, the, uh, the session from your wisdom, then, um, then we welcome that. Um, another thing is if, if there's a particular topic or issue that you would be interested to know, I mean, this is meant to be a high level introduction to food dehydration, talking about dehyd like dehydrators in general, what equipment you need, food safety issues, some tips and tricks, and sharing some recipes. Um, if there is something in particular, a particular question that you have, um, then let us know and we can do our best to, to answer that. Or if we don't have an answer, then we could uh, try to point you to, to where you might get an answer. Um, so that's something that you can take a minute. I mean, you could take a minute to know nutrient loss. Yep, we can, we'll talk to that as a slide about that. Um, and so, uh, and if something comes to you as, as we go through, then please use the chat window to, uh, to put that in because it might help us to know how to speak to a particular slide that's coming up. I also wanted to start by saying that um, we're not the first people um, to do any dehydration. We're not the first people to present about it with, uh, with the club. So Agnes Pomerlo gave a fantastic presentation about 14, 15 years ago. And that was, um, was uh, really uh, useful for, for a number of uh, people who've been in the club for a long time. And so we wanted to acknowledge that uh, we have uh, given some of, the, some of the same information is still valid 15 years later. And, and so we've by, by all means used that. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the benefits of dehydrating, equipment you can use, some food safety um, information, how to store dehydrated food, nutrition, um, some dehydrated items you can just buy and it's easier or some in some cases safer to buy them rather than do it yourself. So we'll talk about that and some tips and tricks, assembling meals, and then we have some recipes. So benefits of food, food dehydration. Um, so it'll last for weeks without re without refrigeration. You can go for a two month trip, and you can bring uh, meat and vegetables and, and a balanced diet with you. And you don't have to; it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Um, dehydrating your own food is much much cheaper than buying prepackaged meals, and often healthier, especially with respect to salt content. Um, it's smaller and lighter than than food that you haven't dehydrated. So even if you're going for, for a short trip, just a few days when um, some ingredients would, would last perfectly well, um, maybe you don't want to portage all that all that water weight and it's nice to, to, to get rid of it. Um, you can cater to individual tastes. Um, you can there's there's you can really uh, you can't dehydrate anything, but you can dehydrate a lot of meals and a lot of your own recipes. You can your own favorite recipes can be can be adapted or modified to something that can be dehydrated quite safely and easily. And so you can you can really make um, just about a lot of uh, not exactly everything, but just about. Um, and you know you can we well, quantities can be adjusted. I mean that gets back to that the food is way cheaper um, to dehydrate yourself, and and you can show off just like uh, Mark has remembered. Hartley's um, beef jerky years later. So the equipment you need is a dehydrator. Um, Nesco is the most popular. This is, um, it's, it's 
fairly inexpensive, less than $100. And um, it's it's adaptable because these, um, the picture shows four dehydrator trays. You can buy extra trays and depending on what you're dehydrating, you can stock up to eight or 10 um, and, and use the same motor for those. Um, Excalibur is um, is a premium. It's it's more expensive, um, but it does it. It's the the um, you're getting your money's worth. You know you get what you pay for, um, and so if you're going to be doing quite a lot of dehydrating, then you might want to consider getting an Excalibur machine because you will get a better result. Um, it is possible to dehydrate some things with um, in an oven, very, very low heat with a wooden spoon to open it up and to, to let the, the moisture come out. Um, you can do that with fruit and herbs. It's really not recommended for anything else. Um, I know some people who've said that they've made beef jerky that way and um, it's, it's not recommended for food safety reasons. Um, so those are really, I recommend that you get, I mean, the Nesco, Really, just on one week long trip, the amount you would save dehydrating your food versus buying dehydrated food, the, the dehydrator purchase will, will pay for itself. So, look for temperature control and look for the ability to do fruit letters and liquids, which is extra inserts that you can put in. So, these are add ons that you can get for dehydrators. Like when I bought my Nesco machine, it came with one solid tray. Um, and, but what's nice about it is that those Nesco solid trays are easy to buy. Um, and you can buy them also for the, for the Excalibur machine. And another thing is to get mesh trays. So these prevent small pieces from falling through. Now in both cases, uh, you can, um, you can substitute parchment paper for, um, a solid tray or a mesh tray. Um, uh, this parchment paper, if you're going to use, if you're going to use that for um, for soup, not a good idea. But if you're going to use it for um, fruit leather of something that's not too watery, um, that'll work. You can use it if you're going to, like, if you're going to chop up some onions and lay those out. Um, a mesh tray is going to be best. Parchment paper will work, um, but the dehydration will take a bit longer. Uh, so things about buying a dehydrator. So the cheaper models are, um, they're about $75. Um, they are a little bit less effective for dense foods. And we'll talk about dense foods a bit later. Um, Nesco and Excalibur are the most popular in the club. Uh, so for Nesco, make sure that you get a 600 watt or more. Um, the lower, uh, the, the lower wattage ones, um, they just, they, they, the way they work is that the, they sort of send the heat just up the center. And it doesn't really get throughout the whole thing. And so the, the drying is really uneven. And that's the advantage of the Excalibur is that it's even more even. It's just the, just the way that it's set up with the way that it, it uh, moves the air through and the heat through, um, it it's, it's dries things very evenly. Um, so a typical cost about $130, really nice models, um, a little you know, like over $200, but nowhere near 300. So if you're gonna go for a few trips over the next few years, the dehydrator will pay for itself. Um, and so these are some things to, to look for, temperature control, good air circulation. Um, maybe you can um, pay extra. When I, I bought my uh, Nesco machine years ago, um, and maybe you can buy it so that it comes with more mesh inserts or solid inserts, but at least make sure that those are easy to buy, that, that they're compatible, like mesh inserts and solid inserts are com that are easy to buy that are compatible with the machine you're buying. Um, and it's nice to have extra trays. Um, something also, I mean, very, a lot of people in the club have Nesco machines. And so another consideration, if you need to um, suddenly prepare for a trip really quickly, um, which has happened to me, I had to make three meals in three days. Um, I was able to, to borrow a lot of trays from, from some very kind club members. Um, and so that's, that was, that's also a possibility. It doesn't work with the Excalibur, but um, with the Nesco, it's a possibility. Um, on the, with the recommend, with the, the knowledge that the, the higher the stack, the longer it takes to dehydrate and the more uneven it is. So there are other considerations. So a lot of club members have a dehydrator, um, you know, People uh, might be willing to, to lend you their whole dehydrator, or they might be willing to lend you um, some trays if you need them. And adding trays is okay for foods that are easily dehydrated. Um, and it's not recommended to stack too many for, for meats 
or 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 uh, items that call for high temperature dehydrating because the high temperature just can't get that far up the stack because the the water just cools it down. So aside from the dehydrator, here are some other tools you need. So basically what you need to dehydrate stuff is you need to convert it into small pieces or a puree and then spread it onto the trays of your dehydrator. So you're going to need something to use to make those pieces or to make that puree. So maybe just a knife and a cutting board, um, a vegetable slicer like a mandolin or a grater can help you get even, uh, even slices. The, the more uniform the slices are, the more even the drying is. Um, meat thermometer, when you are uh, preparing meat, um, a safe internal temperature is really, really important for food safety. So a meat thermometer is really important to, to, uh, to uh, confirm that. Um, and um, we're going to talk about uh, blanching. Some foods do best if you blanch them before dehydration. And that's basically you put, you, you, you chop, like let's say carrots. Carrots do well with blanching. You chop them in, in a mandolin, you put them in a sieve, you pour a boiling water over top, and, um, and that's how you, and then it's blanched, and then you put it onto the dehydrator. So a sieve or a colander is going to be important for that. And airtight, airtight storage containers, most of us use Ziploc bags. Um, so downside, I wouldn't really call it a downside of dehydrating, but it is a thing like you can't just decide, um, you know, today at 7.20 p.m. that I'm going to go on a trip starting tomorrow at 7 a.m. Um, and just expect the food to be ready. It does take time. So you generally you need six to 10 hours per dish. So if you're making a dinner, that's six to 10 hours. If you're making two dinners, that's 12 to 20 hours. Um, and sometimes you'll need to divide your meal um, into two dehydration sessions if you're meal prepping for a big group. Um, and then you also need to check that all your food is dry. It might be very, very dry on the outside, but the, if, you, if you break it open, you'll see that it's still a bit moist on the inside. Bacteria can grow in there and that's not safe. Um, and so you, you really do need to, you, six to 10 hours is, is a very rough, um, rough guideline. Uh, some of them will, some will need longer. Um, you know, there, and there are ways, we'll talk in tips and tricks of ways of making, of, of helping that time to, to come down. But part of it is just variables that you can't control. I mean, in summertime, it's very humid and, and, and ambient humidity is, is one of the factors that, that, uh, that, that affects how long it takes to dehydrate. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not a science in terms of predicting how long it'll take because it depends on too many variables. So start meal planning early and you can start meal planning right now. Um, you know, when, when something, if you see something that's, that's on sale, let's say carrots are on sale next week, buy a bunch of carrots, dehydrate them, and then put them into some Ziploc bags, put them in your freezer, and then you have them. And so you can start dehydrating now to be ready for the summer. Okay, so food safety. Um, food safety starts in the home and finishes at the campsite. So you do always need to be, I mean, it's it's the same thing in, in your kitchen in general. I mean, you have to you have to wash your hands, you have to wash um, all your vegetables, you have to, you know, you don't leave meat out on the counter. There are there are things that we do that are common sense because we do it every day and we don't really think about it. Um, and so some of the things that are that are uh, important for food safety and dehydration aren't necessarily common sense just because we don't have the experience yet. Um, but it is really important to remember that um, food can be unsafe and it's easy to keep it, um, it's easy to, to, to make it safe and it just takes a little bit of thought and a few practices to make sure that things are safe. A non-virus, something that could be a problem when dehydrating. Um, yeah, bacterial infection can be a problem. Um, so when you're when you're preparing your food at home for the dehydrator, standard food prep can, practices apply. So if you're gonna if you're gonna get those carrots on sale next week, you should probably peel them, and um, you know cut them with a clean knife on a on a on a clean cutting board, um, and they should be you know ready that you would be able to to just eat them raw, and you blanch them and you put them on the on the dehydrator instead. So all of the the things that you normally do in your kitchen, you need to do those things. Um, but then there are also some other things that, that we don't necessarily 
think about. Um, dehydrating food takes a long time and it starts with a warm and moist environment. Warm, moist environment is a perfect environment for bacteria to thrive. And so we need to think, uh, we need to be careful that we don't give those bacteria an opportunity. Now, part of that is not, in, uh, is not inoculating your food with bacteria in the first place um, by washing your hands and making sure that you use clean implements. Um, and another thing is, is, um, is thinking about, you know, some things prep them ahead of time. So blanching really dense um, uh, like vegetables so that there's, there's, you increase the porosity to allow the, the, the moisture to, 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 to leave a little bit faster. Food or meat rather has to be cooked to a safe internal temperature first and then dehydrated. You cannot use the dehydrator to cook your meat. Um, another thing is that oils don't dehydrate. Dehydration gets rid of water. It doesn't get rid of oil and oil can go rancid and it can ruin, it can ruin your food. Um, so these are some things that aren't, that are, that are not uh, normally considerations when you're, when you're cooking at home. Okay. So wash your fruits and fruits and vegetables well before you, before you prepare them for the dehydrator. Um, be mindful of cross contamination, just like with regular, with, with your regular food prep, you know, you wouldn't cut some meat and then cut some vegetables on the same cutting board. Um, it, you, that needs to be that that's important. And it's even more important in a dehydrating context because in dehydration, by definition, you're creating an environment where bacteria can thrive. So you really, really need to keep those food free from bacteria before they go into, into the, um, the dehydrator. Many fruits need to be peeled to dehydrate and rehydrate well, like mangoes, dragon fruit, um, apples. So some of these are things you would peel anyway, but things like peaches and nectarines, I eat the skins, um, but if you're going to dehydrate them, uh, I would recommend that you get rid of the skins because they dehydrate and rehydrate. They don't, re they don't behave well, and they also have very, very different uh, properties in terms of, of um, water transfer. And so um, the, that lack of uniformity uh, does create some complications for good dehydration. Um, a side benefit is that removing the peel does make it does make the the food cleaner, and so it reduces the uh, the uh, the likelihood of of any um, of, of any bacterial contamination. Clean the dehydrators well between your drying sessions. Um, dehydrator trays, at least the ones for my Nesco, are really really awkward to clean. They're big, and they've got like tiny, tiny pieces, and it's a lot of work to clean them, but it's really, really important to clean them properly. What I usually do is I stick them in the sink, soak them overnight, and then they're a lot easier to clean the next day, um, but do clean it well. Um, also, don't mix trays that need different dehydrating temperatures. So different um, foods do best being dehydrated at different temp different temperatures. So plan your plan your dehydration. You know, if you're if you're meal planning, let's say you're going to be doing uh, three dinners and two breakfasts. Um, think about all the things you're going to dehydrate, and if you've got a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be dehydrated at 145 dehydrate as much of that at 145. You've got stuff at 165. Save that for a different dehydrating session. Um, because the two, the temperature, if it's too, if it's too low, something might not necessarily dehydrate properly. It might not dehydrate quickly enough. And so you might get some contamination or, or a chance for that bacteria to grow. If the temperature is too high, it can harden the outside and then make it really hard for the interior to dry. It can destroy some nutrients. Um, yeah, or too low can, might not effectively dry the product. Um, thin slices or thin layers does, it's faster, it's safer, but it, you know, the, the thinner it is, the more trays you're going to need, the longer you're going to need to, you're, uh, you're going to need to plan back even longer to get all your dehydration sessions done in time for you to leave on your trip. So choose the right temperature and don't overfill the dehydrator trays. The way dehydrators work is that they create heat and they've got a fan that pushes that heat through the food to take the water out. And so if you've got something that's completely packed, then the air can't go through and it's not going to work. You need to, you need to have spaces between whatever it is that you're putting on your dehydrator tray in order to allow that air to go through. Um, so avoid fatty foods or foods that contaminate easily. You can put anything in a dehydrator. 
but it doesn't mean you should. Um, so internal temperature for me, this is the most critical thing that um, is, is you need to kill hazardous microorganisms. You need to cook the meat to a safe internal temperature. Um, so beef, for example, should be cooked to an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you can uh, go on to Google and, 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 and find out the safe internal temperature for, for anything. I know off the top of my head, chicken breast is 155, chicken thighs are 165, salmon is 158. Um, and I, those are the ones I, those are the things I cook the most. So those are the things I know off the top of my head, but just make sure that you get, we'll be talking about this later, whatever you get from the internet, make sure that it's from a large organization, a government or a university. Um, but this information is really easy. So look up what is the safe internal temperature for what it is that you're cooking and cook to that. Um, also eggs and dairy. Um, home dehydrating eggs and milk product is not recommended. Um, I know that a lot of people have done it and thankfully you haven't had, a lot of you haven't had, had complications, but there is not a single food safety expert on this continent who recommends it. Um, the, the risks are too high. So safe alternatives, powdered dairy products are inexpensive and easy to buy in bulk stores. And then, and we've got a list later on. It's not just milk. You can get powdered yogurt, powdered buttermilk, powdered cream, probably not cream, but you can get a lot of powdered dairy products. Um, powdered eggs, it is more expensive, but it's gonna be safe. Um, and here's um, a link to, and, and this is on the website. So it's Happy Yak is a company out of Quebec that makes um, freeze dried egg powder. And so if that's something that you want because eggs are so nutritious, they really are. And they're a great source of, of, um, of protein and they, they add a lot to your baking, um, go that way. If you need eggs for texture, um, then vegan egg substitute works super well and is way cheaper, um, but it's not a nutritional substitute. Um, fats, uh, we talked about this before, dehydration gets rid of water. Um, fats is a different substance. Dehydration doesn't get rid of it. And fats and oils can go rancid. So um, dehydrate fat-free foods, get rid of the fat as much as possible, and then bring the fat separately so you can add it in when you're cooking. Um, we also have, this. these are some sources, that they're not by any means the only sources of, of expertise that you can go to. Um, and these links are also on the website. So let me see if I can go to a different screen and I'll show you the website and show you what I'm talking about. So here's the website and the food safety is the thing I'm talking about right now. So here are four sources. One of them is Canadian, the other ones are American, but the research is the same. Um, so if we go into here, for example, this is the University of Minnesota. Um, and they've got um, some, all of these have some really good information. And I've also found that if you can, if, if there's something, um, that you can't find on, on the website. There is, there's contact information that you can get. And also I find if you, if you look a little bit through the website and find a professor, professors generally love talking about their research. And so if there's a question and the, the extension group staff aren't, um, aren't responding to you, just poke around a little bit on the, on the website and find uh, the university website and find a professor um, who, whose area of research is, is food safety and, and send your question to them. I, like, there is a really high chance that that person will get back to you with a, with a, very, with a very fulsome answer and be very happy to, to have found somebody who's enthusiastic who has questions about what they research because professors are, are used to boring people to death. So let me switch back to the presentation um, and share. So this is when it, when it comes to this food safety part of the website, um, Hartley, Nancy and I, we're not food safety experts. Um, and so this part of the website is, is coming some of it from our, our common sense of, of just you know how to how to cook for people safely. But 
the stuff that's that's unique to food dehydration comes from these food experts, these food safety experts, because that's not our expertise. Um, and if there's something that we haven't um, answered, or uh, like if you've got a question um, that hasn't that isn't answered by this this session, then do go to the experts. Um, there are there's a lot of bad advice on the internet, um, and so be really really careful of your sources. Uh, when you're looking for uh, information or ideas, check it to make sure that it's it, that it's actually endorsed by experts because um, because the safety issues can be pretty serious. Um, you know, food poisoning is terrible at any time, but if you're like three weeks into the bush, it's that much harder to manage. Um, so storing dehydrated food. Um, so one of the things that can be hard to know when your when your food is done, um, there is a there is a, a way that you can calculate um, if you're if you're mathematically minded on the University of Guelph um, resource. Um, that's the the University of Guelph link on the website sends you to a, a several hundred page PDF. And in chapter seven, there's a whole series of steps to calculate. Um, if you've taken out enough water to get it down to um, uh, the, the 10 to 12 percent moisture content. Um, most of us aren't going to do that. Um, so the, it, it really depends on the food and it's going to depend on you've got to check it. Um, so uh, herbs should crumble or crack. Uh, fruits should be pliable but not sticky. Um, and berries, like if you do a whole bunch of like uh, blueberries or raspberries, they should rattle against each other. They should be a little bit like ball bearings. Um, vegetables need to dry more than fruit and should be crisp, or you should even be able to break little pieces of carrot, for example. Meat and jerky, you need to pre-cook. Um, jerky can be post-cooked, but it does need to be cooked in an oven to um, at, at 325 or 350. Um, and it'll be slightly pliable, but, it, but you should be able to break it. Um, oh, gray bar. How about now? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'll give you a second to read that stuff. I was on my screen, but I assumed it was just my computer complaining. Okay, so you need to check your food. Um, and you need to check when it's cool, which means you may need to heat it back up in the dehydrator and let it cool back down again. Um, if you if you guess wrong, because you know, like. You want to dehydrate. I mean, if you're going to err between under dehydrating and over dehydrating, of course, over dehydrate. But the longer you dehydrate something, the the um, more you degrade its nutrition and the more you degrade its its uh, its texture and its quality for um, rehydrating into something that's going to be pleasurable to eat. So um, you don't want to leave it in uh, indefinitely. Vacuum packing can yes. Um, vacuum packing can prolong the dehydrated foods because it, um, it, it keeps um, moisture out. If you already have a vacuum packer, then go ahead and use it. Um, one disadvantage is, is, is um, environmental. They've got uh, really, they use really thick plastic and um, it's not reusable. Like Ziploc bags, you can clean them and reuse them. Um, but if it's something that's already part of, of what you do, um, or uh, you know, if you're gonna um, make a, a like a, if you're gonna do a lot of tripping, um, and you're gonna be going out in the woods for like two months at a time, like maybe the stuff for for the second month would definitely um, survive a lot better. Survive is the wrong word. Um, it would come out in much better quality if you vacuum packed it. Moisture management. So make sure the food is completely cool before you transfer it into an airtight container because as it's cooling, it will give off a little bit of moisture. So if you put it into the air cont airtight container before it's completely cooled off, then some moisture is going to collect on the inside of that container. And a vacuum sealer may be a good investment. Um, it does last longer and it's more compact, but it does produce more, more plastic waste. Um, to be safe, store dehydrated food in the freezer. Oh, so someone said dry food ha can penetrate vacuum bags. I did not know that. Um, so that's another reason to stick with uh, with Ziploc bags. And package only as much as you will use at one time. Um, so if each time you open the package, you're going to let in more moisture. So you know if you're going to uh, use a certain amount of, let's say you've you've um, dehydrated 
several pounds of carrots, um, maybe de uh, package it into small containers, like a few small Ziploc bags, so that each Ziploc bag is a meal's worth of carrots. Okay, so Mark uh, just uh, put something. Mark, can you uh, can you speak to this? I don't understand what you just said. So, a Ziploc bag. You know, the great thing is it's got that zipper thing, and above the zipper thing is more plastic. So, what I have done in the past is um, I don't zipper it shut, but I put the top of the Ziploc bag into my uh, sealer or vacuum sealer. So it sucks out the air, seals the bag, but it hasn't actually touched the zipper. So when I go to use it, I'll uh, you know, open up the bit that's been sealed, but the zipper is still intact, so I can reseal the bag the same way you would for a Ziploc bag. And I find that's handy because um, I then, after I've emptied out the stuff that I sealed, I now have a... Uh, a Ziploc bag that I can use for, for example, uh, you know, stinky or smelly garbage. Right, so that's uh, not something I was aware of. So thanks, Mark, for that. Um, you should uh, you shouldn't keep dehydrated food longer than a year. Um, home dehydrated food, like commercially dehydrated foods, um, they come with their own um, expiry dates. Um, but if you've done it at home, uh, they're there is just a lot of things that you're not able to measure, a lot of things you're not able to control. Um, just assume that after a year in the freezer, it's done. So at the end of the summer, you're not going to do any more camping. Use up that stuff in your winter cooking. Make some soups or something. Okay, so here's somebody asked about nutrition at the start. Um, dehydration preserves almost all nutrients. The main things that are destroyed are vitamins A and C and some B vitamins. Um, but you can keep pretty much everything else. So it's it's really good that way. Um, so if you're going to go for a really long trip, probably bring some supplements to compensate for this vitamin A and C and the vitamin B. But if you're going for a week or so, don't, then you normally eat a nutritious diet, you're going to be fine. You're not going to end up with any malnutrition issues. Okay, so, um, you know, we're talking about stuff that you can dehydrate at home, and that's that's going to be a fantastic part of your camping toolbox. Some stuff, it just makes sense to purchase it because it's it's easier or it's safer or it's faster. Um, and these are things that can help you to um, uh, just, just fill out your meals and make and make really interesting meals. So um, some things like, like powdered eggs and powdered milk, we've already talked about that. Um, that's a food safety issue. Um, some other things like uh, powdered refried beans, that's also probably a thing that probably wouldn't dehydrate very like uh, all that safely at home. Maybe it would, um, but it's something that you can purchase. Um, so if you want to make uh, tacos in camp, you can you can make your your meat uh, your your uh, meat mixture the way you normally would um, and dehydrate that, and then bring along some refried beans to uh, uh, you know to add some some protein and some extra texture. Um, so this uh, list. Actually, I realize I don't think we put this on the website, but I will put it up there because it's a it's a good resource. Um, so these are some things that don't need to pre to be pre soaked. So that means you come into camp, you start making your dinner, and when it makes sense, you add this you add this in, um, or you, uh, you you follow the the rehydration instructions and and incorporate it into your dinner um, as 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 makes sense. There are some other things that do require a pre-soak. Um, so some examples uh, are here. The way you pre-soak it is you mix it with water at least a few hours before you plan to use it. Um, now, something to consider is, is a food safety issue. Uh, don't start, like let's say you're gonna, um, for proteins, especially like uh, like shrimp and scallops, don't start it in the morning because you know, you've got, you're gonna have unrefrigerated shrimp um, all day and that's you know you wouldn't leave shrimp out on your counter in your kitchen you shouldn't leave it out in your boat um, so so consider the food safety issue um, and use a container with a very good seal Nalgene bottles are amazing for this 
and keep it in your food barrel while you're pre-soaking it. And um, so these are, uh, I, I don't know how to go back, but these are some, um, some things that we know of that, are per that, that can be purchased. Um, if you have some things uh, that you know of that, that you can buy dehydrated, please throw them in the chat window um, and, and we can add them to this list before we put it up onto the website for everybody to have as your reference. So different places you can go for your dehydrated foods, um, large grocery store chains, bulk food stores, um, ethnic food stores, uh, you'll find a lot of, I mean, this, we did not by any means give a, 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 a full list of all the dehydrated foods that are available in, in ethnic food stores. So, you know, go down to Chinatown, go to TNT, um, I don't even know what other ethnicities use a lot of dehydrated food. I'm sure there's lots of them. Go in there and, and look around and, and ask. And there's probably some amazing flavors that you can bring into your, into your camp cooking. And you can also get some, um, some really good stuff online. Um, I think at this point I'm handing over to Nancy. Is that right? Yes, um, Maria, I don't, I can't share screen. So can you continue as I'm finishing to Yeah, just through? let me know when you want me to, to switch the slide. Okay. Um, so we uh, ha kind of put our heads together about cookbooks that we recommend it. And I think the, the main Bible for all of us is the fork in the trail. Um, that seemed to be where most of the recipes came from that we really liked. Um, another fork in the trail is another good source. It's more vegetarian oriented so that if you're on a group with people who prefer to eat vegetarian style, that's a really good one. The other three, uh, Maria, you might have to speak to them because I don't know them. I understand the dehydration cookbook for outdoor adventures is a really good resource. Yeah, it's um, really amazing. The first half of it is, is sort of theory. Um, and reference, and then the second half is is a whole bunch of recipes. It's a it's an excellent excellent book. Um, well, that, that's one I think I'm going to add to my my three, which is the fork in the trail and another fork in the trail. Some of the other ones, like the lip smacking backpacker and a couple of others, we found we didn't really use the recipes from, but I think um, other people may have some that they might want to add later on in in the chat box. Uh, the backpack gourmet is that one of your additions? Um, that's a, I, I think that that's Hartley's. That's Hartley, so he could uh, speak to that. Yeah, I think okay. the Wana Pate one is a really good one as well. Yeah, I really love that one. It's um, Wana Pate. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, is um, it's a, a it's a canoe camp, and they they bring their campers out for, mm -hmm. for backcountry trips from anywhere from from one to eight weeks. And um, so they've, they've got um, hordes of hungry teenagers and they, the Wana Pate cookbook is, has got a lot of um, really crowd friendly food that is nutritious and filling and, um, and, and inexpensive. Um, I would say like for, well, but not having seen two of the other books, if I just had one book, I think it would be a fork in the trail. Maria, would you agree or would you say the dehydrator cookbook one? Oh, um, that's a good question. What the, the advantage to the dehydrator cookbook is that for a geek like me, it's got lots of reference material and theory. Um, and that's something that I really like. I mean, if theory isn't really your thing, then that would you probably wouldn't read those pages anyway. And the fork in the trail has some fantastic recipes. And she's got good information information about how to go about dehydrating and you know separating out ingredients so that you're not cooking meat with vegetables all the time so that they dehydrate at different rates and and therefore you know you're you're guaranteed better results kind of thing and then putting it together and what to put in your in your bag and and uh you know how to measure how much water you need to add back and that type of thing yeah, they've got really good guidance for that. Yeah. Okay, you want to move on to the next one, Maria, please? Yep. Okay, tips and tricks. So dehydrating tricks, and, and some of these certainly came from Agnes, and we've been using them over the years, but some of them uh, we've added in by ex from experience. So turning food and shuffling your trays around 
to ensure even drying is really important. Break up the chunks of food. I find when I'm um, dehydrating things like, uh, let's say a, ch a chicken dish, that the, and one where the sauce and the meat get dehydrated together, that you'll get wet spots. And so sometimes after things have dried, I'll, I'll, I'll take out the things that are really dry so they don't over dry, but then have to put back in sections that are not dry, just making sure that the sections that are not dry, you're still encompassing all the, all the moisture parts of the food. Um, shuffling the trays is really important. I find that the food that's on the bottom tray closest to the, to the bottom tends to uh, dehydrate faster than something that might be at the top for some foods, but it's vice versa for others. So shuffling the trays around every few hours really makes a difference. Use the temperature control on the dehydrator in a lot, and it often has guidance, like my NASCO will say, it says herbs, or it says fruit and vegetables, or it says meat, and that helps so that you know what, what temperature to dehydrate at. The one I had previously didn't, and it was gas and maybe not gas quite right. Um, spices become muted when dehydrating. So you'll find that a food that you think is going to taste very spicy when you get to camp may not taste nearly as spicy. So you can, over, you can compensate for that by adding more spices when you're cooking it or bringing the spices with you um, to camp and adding them there. Speaking on behalf of myself and a couple of other people that I know who really find uh, strong hot spices um, upset our stomachs, we really appreciate when people bring the extra spices to camp so that the food isn't too spicy when you're trying to compensate. Um, don't dehydrate sweet and savory at the same time. Favors, flavors will mix and they will for sure, particularly if things are uh, strong flavored. You can group various fruit level uh, leathers into the same drying batch, but avoid making trays that re require different temperatures. So if you were cooking fruit leathers, I think most of them are the same temperature, but if you're mixing fruit leather with let's say meat, you don't wanna do that for sure. Um, and you'll get different um, drying times and different moisture levels, different food will hold moisture differently. Avoid overloading your dehydrator. So if you're cooking, if you're dehydrating uh, like a main course, really stick to maybe about the four trays so that you're getting the right, uh, the right amount of um, heat and dryness going around. Same thing with overfilling your trays. If you overfill the trays, the food is just not gonna dry. You, you really, and I think Maria mentioned this easier. And your dehydrator will run for a long time. Make sure that you have it on something that's not gonna be flammable. I have uh, a large metal onion, uh, a large metal oven sheet, you know, one of those aluminum ones. And that's what I sit my dehydrator on when it's drying just because it, I don't want it to burn the, the surface that it's sitting on. Okay, Maria, next one, please. Um, I think Maria mentioned this before, but I'll reiterate it. You cut dense vegetables into small, even sizes, and this helps them to dehydrate and rehydrate faster. And it really does help to have a food processor um, cutting it or a grater or a mandolin, you get much better consistency. And if you're cutting up a lot of, uh, let's say carrots for a, a large group or a large meal, it, that's a long time standing there cutting carrots and you're not gonna get even pieces. So you're not gonna get even drying. Um, I find, and this was, is one I use often using pre-cut frozen vegetables. It takes away a lot of the prep time and I, because it's fairly evenly sized, I find they dehydrate nicely and, and all about that at the same time. Fruits that brown like apples and bananas can be soaked in ascorbic acid water for five minutes before dehydrating. And I also have used lemon juice. I'll soak them in lemon juice. Have you tried that, Maria, lemon juice? I um, haven't, but I can see it working. I think it's the acid rather than the, um, than the ascorbic side of it. That, that... Yeah, yeah. And so if you don't happen to have ascorbic, or ascorbic acid and you're not going to the the far, you know, the pharmacy or somewhere where you're going to be able to pick it up. Um, it works really well with lemon juice as well. Um, some 
some fruits that are slightly overripe but are otherwise okay to eat can be dehydrated like dark bananas but overripe berries that are, are typically moldy and so they're not suitable for dehydrating. And some dehydrated foods can be pulverized into a powder when dry and this helps with rehydration. So we were wondering what dehydrating tricks work for you. And if you have some, add them to the chat window because we might uh, be interested in adding them to the, the website as well after, yeah. Okay, next one, please. Preparing meat, this is the, I would say meat is the trickiest thing that you're likely to be dehydrating. And you wanna have the pieces as small as you can get them. Um, ground lean meat, like extra lean beef broken up and fully cooked works well. Solid meat has to be cooked to a safe internal temperature and then shred it with two forks. And the smaller you can shred the pieces, the better they're gonna uh, rehydrate and the less tough and chewy your, your dinner is gonna be when you get there. Beef jerky, you want to trim the fat. You freeze it slightly to slight, slice it thinly. But, and how you slice it either on the grain or across the grain affects the texture of your jerky when it's done. And then you cook it to a safe internal temperature before dehydration. And this is a newer, a newer thing to do. And Hartley said that he had done it just to see the difference. And he said he could tell absolutely no difference between cooked versus uncooked meat when he was making the jerky and that for the safety factor of of having it um having it cooked to a, a good temperature before it's dehydrated it's well worth doing if it turns out like that and flank steak works really well because it's very lean after cooking and particularly with hamburger you want to rinse the fat off in a sieve with hot water before you dehydrate it and i find um jerky and other meat I'll often sit it on paper towels and blot it as much as I can to get as much of the fat off it and um, you dehydrate it at least 150 degrees okay select low fat meat and cook it before dehydrating keep going Maria please and, if, and the one thing to think about is if you eat it raw it probably doesn't need pre-cooking so most, most foods that you can eat raw do not need to be cooked before dehydrating. But everything else, if you eat it cooked, you should be cooking it first, okay? Fibrous vegetables, you soften the fibers before dehydrating by pre-cooking or freezing. And you can saute onions until soft in little bits of water, not oil. That being said, I very rarely, unless it's in a part of a recipe, um, dehydrate onion because you can buy dried onion flakes and they seem to work just as well. Uh, blanched vegetables like celery, broccoli, kale, carrot, or asparagus by pouring boiling water over the cut veggies in a sieve. And Maria mentioned that before. Freeze the cut veggies on a sheet pan and then you transfer them directly to the dehydrator. And blanching fibrous vegetables will taste better and last longer. So blanching is an important thing when you've got fibrous vegetables. Fruit, fruit lends itself really well to dehydrating. You wanna cut it in thin uniform pieces and dry on your mesh trays. Peeling fruit is recommended like with apples. And this was one I didn't know, Maria, maybe this was from you, slice or break the skin of grapes. And I had not tried, maybe Hartley, I hadn't tried dehydrating grapes before, but I suppose it's, not that different from having raisins. Make sure your fruit is at peak ripeness um, because if, it, if it's even starting to go off, you're gonna taste it on your uh, finished product. And, and I, that happened to me last summer, I was dehydrating strawberries and there was a few strawberries in the mix that had, had gotten just a little past their best before. And, and I could taste it on the strawberries after. They were fine, but you could still taste the difference. Um, fruit can be pureed and made into fruit leathers. And I've often made fruit leathers for my grandkids for school snacks instead of fruit roll-ups using frozen fruit. So I just pureed in the blender and then put it on the trays and then take it off and roll it up. And that's a huge hit with them. They love it. Um, and you could try dehydrating fruit like watermelon, which tastes just like candy, 
you just cut it into thin, even slices after you've um, taken the rind off or cut it first and then take the rind off and it's delicious. Melon, pineapples, mango, as well as um, berries, apples and bananas. And, and it's really nice when you, you're on your trip to have something different like um, dehydrated pineapple or melon. It's a nice addition on a, a lunch at, toward the end of the trip, okay? I'm lactose intolerant. Uh, does watermelon take a long time? I don't, I can't remember. It's a couple of years since I did it, but it didn't seem like it took a long time because it's so much, it's such a watery fruit. So I'm really lactose intolerant. So I have tried different things on different trips. Uh, one of which is to use powdered coconut milk, which is fine except that um, you will get a coconutty taste on things. I looked into buying things. I've bought powdered soy milk um, and that was fine, but it didn't, uh, it didn't rehydrate as quite as well as I would have liked it to. Um, and it was expensive and not everybody likes soy milk. So I then decided I'd like to have some almond milk looked it up, couldn't find it. When I did find it, it was outrageously expensive and it had to come from the States and it was gonna take weeks to do it, um, to get there. So I did try to, after reading about dehydrating milks, which you don't wanna dehydrate a, a dairy milk, um, but I did try to rehydrate with some success, with a lot of success actually, almond milk. And so I just bought like the one liter uh, box of almond milk, which is now not quite a liter and put it on uh, the fruit roll-up trays, the solid trays, and dehydrated it. And it works really well. Uh, you do have to powder it after because it, it, uh, it sticks to the, the tray, which is a bit of a nuisance, but you do have to powder it. It comes off in kind of like little thin strips. And then after I um, powdered it in the blender, I put it back in and dried it again for about another hour or so, because I find putting things in the blender to powder them um, seems to create a bit of moisture just from the heat of the blender. Um, I did dehydrate it on the fruit and vegetable setting for 10 to 12 hours. And you remove your flaky bits, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, you remove the flake, flaky bits with a, like a, a spatula or a knife, you have to scrape them off. It is a nuisance. If you don't have to do it, don't do it. But for somebody like me that really needs to do it, um, it was better than nothing. And I found that three teaspoons of powder equaled a cup of milk. But one, one of those liter boxes of almond milk makes a very small amount of powder. So it's still somewhat expensive, but at least it's available. Okay. Assembling meals. So you take all your ingredients for each meal separately and you, uh, you, you gather them together, you, uh, include the written instructions of how to prepare the meal when you get to camp. And after a long day of paddling and a period of time, you're not gonna remember. So those little sticky notes are really important. And, uh, and then and this, it says here, if, if you can't help out, you, you're exhausted or whatever, then at least someone can prepare the meal in your place. You gather them all together and then you can put them in a mesh produce bag or I've bought um, uh, the lawn, like the mesh Ziploc bags for lingerie at the dollar store and that's what I keep mine in. And they zip closed and they're washable. And so those have worked. I know other people have just used, um, you know, uh, just a solid little bag, like a, a bag that you might put shoes in or something or a gift wrap bag, that type of thing. But they work really well and you have all your ingredients together, your instructions, and you just uh, label it to which meal it is and pull it out. It works really well and it helps to organize you and it keeps things organized in your barrel. And then you would designate a separate bag as a pantry for ingredients common to many meals like oil or spices. And we find we also have like a coffee bag or a breakfast drink bag and um, things to add to cereals so that you can just pull those out like brown sugar or uh, dried cranberries or that kind of thing. And just you have your different bags in your barrel 
And because they're in bags and because I'm using the, the uh, lingerie bags, I find that um, food will fit in around it, so it, each other. Whereas if they're in a tight bag, you're just in a package. Although that may take up less room too. So it's kind of an individual preference. Okay. And then these are our favorite recipes that we came up with, most of which are from A Fork in the Trail. And we did put the sources. And here's a, a, pay, a slide about your own recipes that can be dehydrated. So these are the types of things people have dehydrated. And actually, I've seen a couple of these flashing up as, as uh, on the chat boxes. Tomato-based spaghetti sauce. So low-fat meat drain, no dairy or cheese. Uh, another one that I've used, which is a commercial one, is Mike's spaghetti sauce, which we can get over here on the Quebec side in a jar. And it's really good. And it dehydrates really well. Um, and you can get a three meat one. Chili, I did see someone say that they had, had uh, dehydrated chili and the beans uh, dehydrated well. Low fat meat drained, dal, uh, salsa, applesauce, applesauce and other fruit puree for uh, leather, uh, stew with shredded meat well trimmed, other ingredients finely chopped, cool in the fridge and skim the fat before dehydrating. Hungarian goulash, and then chili again. And what recipes have you successfully de dehydrated and add to the chat window? Okay. Um, so I think people have been adding stuff to the chat window all along about recipes that you've successfully dehydrated, which is fantastic. Um, I, Nancy, I mean, I kind of think that we could stop talking here at this point. I mean, what we have is a whole bunch of recipes uh, for like um, breakfasts, lunches, salads, desserts, and all of these are on, on the website. So you don't need to take notes. Um, and let me just show you where that is on the website. Um, so under recipes, we've got links to the favorite cookbooks, which we talked about earlier. Um, and here, um, there's there's you can see the recipes, but when you are the the books, and when you click on the link, you'll go to a place where you can find out more information about the book and and how to um, and how to how to purchase it. So that's there for you. And let me get rid of this. Are you seeing this gray bar? Gray? Oh, they're going away. Um, and and then this is where we we have these are all recipes that that we've tried and um, and so you can just come in here uh, to the website and you've got you've got it all there um, so that's that's where you can take a look at that and to remind you I know that some people came on um, uh, after we started so if you go to go through the chat and go up to the very start you'll see the link to this the, this website link that I'm that I'm referring to and um, so I do recommend that you uh, navigate to that uh, now during the session and bookmark it because we um, I've, I've Ask for it not to be indexed. So this is going to be really hard to, to find after after we're done here, or like through using a using a, a search engine. I mean, and I see some good ideas. I just quickly went through the, the chat box, and uh, there's there's some more ideas that we can probably add in, Maria, to the. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Um, and uh, somebody asked about, oh, people are saying they can't find the website link. Uh, go into the chat. I'll, I'll repost it in the chat. Um, it's, it's at the top. Um, and whoops. Oh, there, Mark just. There it is. Mark did it. Oh, I see. You only see the chat from when you joined. I didn't realize that. Okay, so um, at this point, um, I, people have been asking questions throughout, so maybe you don't have any questions, but um, if you do, now's a good time to ask. Uh, 
Somebody asked about uh, adding wine. Oh, I think you answered that. Adding wine, like when you're cooking? Yeah. I think the the rest of the beef bourguignon recipe or the mushroom bourguignon, you you add the it. She does explain about how to do that. I think you add it and reduce it at the time. Um, David, your hand is up. Yeah, I just had a comment. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the Blood Vein River last summer with Hap Wilson, and. We were out for 12 days and he had nothing dehydrated. He did everything either fresh or packaged or whatever. And I guess it just goes to show if you do it enough that you get good at it. But I am a firm believer in dehydrating stuff. So somewhere there's a balance that uh, that works well. But it was interesting just to watch the way they worked, him and his nephew. And it was it was really kind of entertaining, quite frankly. <laughs> so, did they carry all the uh, all the stuff with them to make it fresh? Yeah, you know, he they just I forget how many food barrels they had, but uh, no, everything everything he had it all fit. In mind we had an awful lot of fish. The Blood Vein River has almost nobody on it, and we were at a falls one night, and his nephew caught twenty six fish in two hours, all pickerel. Oh, okay. <laughs> So if we wanted fish for any meal, it was there. <laughs> so I don't know how much food he took home, but uh, no, they did, they did a wonderful job. But anyway, it's just, it's, it's just possible, but I wouldn't do it myself. I love dehydrated food. It's small, it's light, etc. Uh, after about six days, fine, you know, I'll give up and start eating dehydrated food. But uh, it was just, it was a real eye opener, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the like the this whole this seminar is about food dehydration, and so that's what we focused on. I mean, if we wanted to do a seminar on food prep, yeah. uh, camping, then we then there's there are other definitely um, other yeah. ways to do. It. No, I, I appreciate that, and, I, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, uh, Bruce had a question in the chat: As an extra safety step, do you cook sauces with the ground beef or dry it separately and only add at the camp? My uh, preference is to cook the meat separately. Um, and, um, and then I, I either like, I start with ground meat and cook it down, like cook it and, and rinse it, or else I start with solid meat, like a pork tenderloin and shred it either way. Once it's down to small pieces, I rinse though. I rinse that, um, with hot water and then I dehydrate the meat separately. That's my preference. Um, Nancy was saying that sometimes, uh, she'll cook meat in, but then Nancy, you can you speak to that? You were saying something about how sometimes you have to do an extra step or something? Yeah, so the extra step is that you you have to really look at it carefully and and some of it will, it doesn't, I find it doesn't dry evenly uh, when you have the some of the sauces with the meat. And I'm just thinking it's one of the, I think it's the chicken curry with raisins and uh, currants, the, the, that recipe that I've included from a fork in the trail and it, it says to dehydrate it all at once, but I find sometimes the, the raisins don't dehydrate or the chicken doesn't dehydrate at the same rate as everything else. So I, you know, now being better informed, I think I would dehydrate that separately in future. Uh, question, so for the curries, uh, when you said you dehydrate them separately, so do you add an extra lot of spices while you're making it or you add it uh, when you rehydrate again? Uh, just because uh, it, it was mentioned before that uh, once we dehydrate the food, uh, the flavor becomes less uh, intense when you My dehydrate. own preference is to bring extra spices with me um, so that I can, I'll rehydrate it and then I'll, I'll uh, season it to taste. Um, okay. And what's nice about that is um, sometimes I'll cook something that's a bit spicy, but different people have different spice tolerances. And so that way, um, we can accommodate that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Well, thank you everybody um, for your for your great participation. Um, Mark, did you have any closing remarks that you wanted to, to make? Yeah, well, first of all, I wanna thank uh, uh, all three of you, you know, including the Invisible Hartley, because I'm, I'm sure that uh, he, he had his two cents worth uh, earlier on when, well, when you weren't here. Much more than two cents. <laughs> um, so again, thank you very much for this. The session has been recorded and it will be posted on the, uh, the club's YouTube page. Um, hold on, I'm just gonna uh, stop recording.